All right. So welcome again. Thank you everybody who's come. Um, and I'm really excited you've decided to join us today to learn how to teach synchronously in Zoom. Um, most of you, I think everybody here knows me. I am Beth Shepard, the instructor, what am I? The director of instructional design here at Pool College of Management. Um, I am joined today by a lot of people to help. Um, so I've got Jessica Moran, who is the MAC online program coordinator. Um, Elizabeth Shamblin will be coming in soon. She is our instructional design support person. And then um, there's a whole lot of you faculty here, but two that I've asked especially to come because I know they were teaching synchronously this fall are Allison Lowe Reed and Bonnie Hancock. So I'm gonna call on them at various points during um, today's session to say, to ask for their tips or advice. But anybody else who is here who has questions, comments, anecdotes, please feel free to chime in at any point during today's session. Um, we only have an hour and a half and there is a whole lot of stuff to get through. So we're probably not gonna get through all of it. That's okay. Um, and if there's something I can't answer because I don't know everything about Zoom, either Jessica or Elizabeth can probably help or we will take notes. Jessica, I'm putting this on you. Um, <laughs> we're gonna take notes of any questions we can't answer during the session and then we'll follow up afterward. Um, our, one of our major goals today is not just to talk to you about how to use Zoom for online classes, but actually demo its use. So we may not get through all of the how-to step-by-steps, but you'll find in our accompanying documentation, um, which I'm gonna put in the chat and I will also send out after the session, um, we have step-by-step -step in these. So let me put these in the chat. Give me one moment. Okay, so I just dropped two links in the chat. Uh, sorry, the first one is broken. Let me fix that. That's what I get for copying and pasting from a Word document. There we go. The first one is um, the documentation that we have worked on in-house on using Zoom. We're gonna be updating it this week. So just know that some things may change um, between now and next week. And Delta has also created a teaching in Zoom site that they keep up to date. So that's another good place to look um, for how to, how to do everything that we're gonna talk about doing in Zoom. All right. I think by now everybody has used Zoom at some point, but just to make sure you know where all the tools are because they do move around sometimes. Um, we have a few interactive tools. Um, let me pull up my spotlight. So at the bottom of your own Zoom window, if you wanna speak at any time today, please do feel free to turn on your mic. You can just press the mute, unmute button. Oops. Um, I'm going all over the place. Uh, if you would like to share your webcam with us, we love to see your smiling faces. So please feel free to turn those on and you can do that with the video button. Um, I am going to run a poll or two in today's session. So there is a polls button where you can see what's happened there. Um, the chat, please also, if you're not comfortable using your microphone or if you don't have a microphone, you can use the chat to talk to us today. Um, the reaction button. If you have a reaction button, give me a reaction now. <laughs> Woo, most people have found it, excellent. So you can see that shows up over the video pane um, and it just stays up for a few seconds. It's a good way to kind of check in and see are people paying attention, especially with smaller classes. And then lastly, if you haven't already opened it up, go ahead and open up your participants list and then once you have opened that up, you'll see you have some buttons over on the side. So if you found the participants area, give me a green check. I'm seeing about half of the people have found it so far. So again, just open up participants and then you'll see these optional buttons. Almost everybody has checked. I'm gonna assume everybody who hasn't checked it's just not paying attention to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear those all. Um, but I will be checking in with you today also through that. 
Um, I am not going to try to keep up with the chat during today's session, but Jessica is monitoring it for me. So every so if you have a question that you type in the chat, every so often I'm going to stop and ask Jessica, hey, are there any questions? And she'll let me know. All right. So any questions before we get into today's session? You can type in the chat. You can raise your hand. There is a hand raise button in the participants area, or you can unmute and talk. Okay, so moving right along. Let's turn off my spotlight. Okay, so take a moment and read over today's objectives. And when you have finished reading today's objectives, give me a green check. Beth, it's still on the Zoom slide. Oh. I don't Sorry. know why my screen share did not keep up with me. Y'all see it now or no? No? Okay. Let's just stop my share. Start over. You see it now or it's still bad? You can see it now. Thanks. I'm sorry, Jessica, what'd you say? It's good. Okay. All right. So now give me a green check when you read the objectives. And thank you very much for letting me know, Jessica. Elizabeth, I'm gonna make you my backup producer, just in case Jessica has a, a lag or anything. If I, if she cuts out, then you can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Beth, I would just add at this point that that stop share and start share is a good tip for everybody to remember anytime you're having a problem or, and, and it happens more often than you, like to think, but it's just a good thing to do. Just stop sharing and start over again. Always, always. And Elizabeth, could you do a private message to Beverly to let her know how to find um, the buttons that are in the participants list? Oh, sure. Thanks. Sure. All right. So it looks like most people have found it. So I'm going to go ahead and move right along. All right, does everybody see a trophy on the screen now? Yes, awesome, okay. So we're gonna talk about how to set yourself up for success. And the first bit of this is before we get into the meat of the discussion, I always recommend setting up ground rules. Set up ground rules with your students. So these are our ground rules for today. Please read through them. And once you read through them, give me a green check. And if you can't find the check, you can also just write done in the chat. It looks like just about everybody is done. So like I said, I do recommend setting up ground rules with your own class. Um, some instructors ask the students to help them write what the ground rules will be. Does anybody have any other ground rules that they'd like to add? You can type them in the chat, or if you're feeling brave, you can say them out loud. Bonnie or Allison, if either of you have done ground rules with your class and want to talk about anything else you put in, feel free. Hey, hey Beth, it's Scott. I do have a ground rule uh, with the Mac students about having their video on because my class is a very engaging discussion and I, it's just a requirement. And I'm putting that in the chat just so we have it in our record of today's um, session. Awesome. I think that's a great ground rule. It really depends on you, your comfort with your students um, and their comfort. But we'll talk about video a little bit more too. All right. And I can also share these slides after today, today too if anybody wants to steal any of the ground rules. You can do that. Okay, so, uh, and also, well, never mind. I'm going to move on because I got to keep things moving. Um, so, one thing that I do want to mention is it takes time to build your skills. You should not pressure yourself to tackle everything that we suggest today all in your first go round. Um, focus on one or two techniques that you want to start with 
And as your comfort level grows, then you can start adding in more things, okay? But always keep baby steps in mind because we're gonna throw a lot at you and you do not need to do all of them. Come on, PowerPoint. Oh, now it doesn't want to advance. There we go. All right. So I used to teach this workshop back uh, before COVID times. And part of that workshop was to say that to be an effective online instructor, you had to feel ready, willing, and enabled. Well, we're throwing that out the window. Doesn't really matter anymore if you're ready or willing because you're doing it. Um, so we're going to quickly cover how to enable yourself. So I want you to take a second to read through these considerations. All right, and part of the um, reason I ask you to read it to yourself is it is pretty boring for me just to read bullets to you. So when I put bullets on the screen, I tend to ask you to read it for yourself. Um, but I do want you to think about this as you prep for your class. A lot of times, and I'm guilty of this myself, we think, oh, I've got class scheduled from 11 to 11.50 or whatever time. And that's the time we think about for meeting, right? But when you're teaching online, especially, it's kind of like before, right? You used to have to have time to gather your stuff, go into the room, set up your PowerPoint if you were using that, talk to the students before class, talk to the students after class, you know, go back to your office, type notes to yourself about things you need to follow up on. We need to schedule that for ourselves when we're teaching online and Zoom as well. Um, so make sure that, you know, if your class is 11 to 11.50, you've set aside 15, 20 minutes before that class to get ready to go. And same with afterwards, set aside time to decompress. Zoom meetings take a lot out of you. So if you have that in your schedule, block it off. So don't schedule back-to-back -back meetings with when you're going to be teaching. Anybody want to add any comments or have any questions? Such a quiet group today. Thank you, Keith, for the thumbs up. <laughs> Hey, Beth, I was going to add something um, that I think it is helpful to think about too. Um, think about your online class as being just like your classroom. And at the end of the class, let students know that you're going to stay online if they have questions. Um, and I've found that they really appreciate um, having that opportunity to just informally ask you some questions after class, just like if they were there in person. I love that tip. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, the next tip for helping yourself is making sure that you practice and feel comfortable with the Zoom technology in advance of when you're teaching. So especially those of you who are teaching this spring synchronously, who did not teach this fall synchronously, you might not be used to running the Zoom room. So um, I recommend finding another faculty member who wants to practice with you. You can jump into a session and one of you act like a student and the other one act like the teacher and just do a run through and then switch roles, right? So you each get comfortable with it. You have someone there who's friendly to help you um, before you get into the, to the real meat of it. Um, also, locate your help resources. Um, so take a deep breath and spend a few minutes reviewing the how-to guides. Uh, you'll feel much more confident once you learn how to use the tool a little better. So we have those resources that I dropped in the chat at the beginning. Um, Delta's guide is really helpful. There's a thousand videos out there. Um, just generally, if you go in feeling like you know, know it a little bit better, you'll feel more comfortable and relaxed during the class. And then something will still go wrong. But that's okay, because we're gonna talk about using a Zoom producer to help you. So um, you can, for those of you who have classes that are over 25 students, you can hire a Zoom producer through the school. Get your requests in now if you haven't already. It's due by the end of the week so that they can make sure that they get it hired in time. Um, if you don't have a Zoom producer, but you have a TA or a GA, you can ask them to fill that role. If you don't have any of those things, you can still ask a student 
to be this person for you. So you just saw me ask Jessica and Elizabeth to let me know if there were questions in the chat. Ask a student to do this. Just call on them at the beginning and say, Bonnie, can you check the chat for me today? And I'm going to ask you to let me know when there's questions. Right? Um, you can some I've seen some professors actually give this out as extra credit. Uh, so Jessica, are there any questions in the chat? Yes, um, the uh, Elena asks, when will we hear if we get a Zoom producer? Such a good question. I am not sure, but I know they are working on it. I just had a meeting with Jonathan, Jonathan from Office of Business Services yesterday, and they're trying to match people up. So the biggest issue right now is that um, mostly they're trying to use students for this role. And so they have to figure out the student schedule and your schedule and find those. Um, so they are actively working on it, <laughs> but I'm not sure when you'll hear exactly. Um, so a couple things to know if you do hire a Zoom producer. One is the instructional design group, we are developing resources. So there's a guide specifically for faculty on how to work with your Zoom producer. And there's a guide for the Zoom producer on how to work with you and learn everything they need to learn. And Elizabeth, I don't know if you have the links um, that you can drop in the chat to the Zoom producer. I have it. I'll find it. Forget me. I have it. I know why I'm asking you to do it when it's, I put it in my notes. Um, there we go. That's the Zoom producer guides. We're also going to make a recorded video for the producer on how to do some of the skills. Um, but I want to talk specifically now about ways that a Zoom producer could help you. So you saw me ask again, Jessica, to let me know what's going on in the chat. What else could a Zoom producer do for you? Type it in the chat, raise your hand if you want to talk on the mic. And we'll make y'all participate. Keith says breakout rooms, 100%. You can have the Zoom producer run the breakout rooms for you. Here is the great thing, good news. If you update, I'm gonna mention this multiple times today. If you make sure that you keep Zoom up to date, which you have to go manually check every so often, the latest update that just came out, I don't, for me, it just came out today, but it may have come out for other people earlier, is that co-hosts can now run the Zoom rooms. You do not have to make your Zoom producer the host anymore. Your co-host can do it. Yay. Um, so there's some stuff going on in the chat where Jordan suggested attendance and Allison said Zoom will take attendance automatically. This is true. If you force your students to sign in, which we're gonna come back to in a bit, then Zoom collects a report and you can see everybody who logged in. If you don't force your students to sign in and they um, come to your Zoom session with a fake name or whatever, that won't be very helpful. So I do recommend making them sign in. However, the flip side of that is if you get participation credit for typing in the chat or speaking audibly, then your Zoom producer could kind of keep that check mark um, log going, um, just literally on pen and paper even. That's a great point. Anything else? Well, Jessica, Elizabeth, you've been Zoom producers, and that's my dog, not my helpful Zoom producer. Y'all have been Zoom producers before. Anything you would add that Zoom producers can do for you? Well, I would say the number one thing um, I found being a Zoom producer is the breakout rooms. They are really stressful if you are trying to present and be present in the room with your attendees while trying to put together breakout rooms, unless you just automatically in it, you know, you, you let the rooms automatically choose. But if you want any kind of grouping amongst your breakout rooms, I would highly recommend having um, a friend, a buddy, a student uh, help do that for you. Um, and, and the monitoring of the chat also helps, especially if you are presenting your content, uh, if you're lecturing and you're and you and you get into your groove and you get into your subject matter and you know the points. I think Jessica's having a little bit of internet issue. 
Uh, another thing that a producer can do is they can schedule the, the meeting for you, the, the class, and then they can make sure all your settings are correct if you want to have people authenticate. And it just it gives you another, you know, you don't have to worry about making sure all the settings are, are, are the right way. Yeah, that's a very great point. Uh, another thing that y'all saw Jessica do for me today is my slide had an advance. I would never have realized that if someone hadn't told me. And sometimes, Beverly knows this, sometimes your students don't tell you. But they're they're tuned out or they're just timid or whatever. So you, you, your Zoom producer can let you know when something is not working right. Um, We'll add that to the board too. Um, I'm trying to think, I know I had a bunch more of things that a Zoom producer can do for you. They're in the description of the Zoom producer job. Um, they can, if you're just not comfortable running the slideshow, they can literally have the slideshow up and you just say, advance the slide, advance the slide. And they can be running that screen share for you. Um, they can help your students. If one of your students is like trying to use the audio and it's not working for them, they can private message the student and um, try to help technical troubleshoot that. And one big one is disaster recovery. So sometimes, you know, your internet goes down or something's up and like your audio is not working. And if you're in there by yourself, you may panic a little bit, but if you have a producer, then you could shoot them a text message and say, something's up, I'm trying to work it out. And the producer can let the students know what's going on and they're a co-host in the room so they can keep control of it. So you don't have what ended up happening in a lot of um, elementary school rooms. I point because my kids are right outside my door taking class. And, you know, if the teacher falls out of the Zoom room because their internet goes down, Zoom assigns host permissions to a random person in the room, which is not great if you're trying to get back in and you had it locked and now your new Zoom host, little Mr. You know, not pay attention is like, I'm not going to let the teacher back into the room or whatever. Um, so, but if you make your Zoom producer your co-host, then they can help keep the class under control maybe even give them something to work on that you texted them. Um, so one thing that I will mention with Zoom producers is always have a back channel communication, which could be text messaging, it could be Google um, chat, it can be Slack, whatever you know you work out with your producer, but it's a way that they can get your attention and you can get theirs while you're in a live session. Um, so they can let you know, hey, we can't hear you anymore or whatever. Um, and Jessica, are there any questions? Yeah, there was one more about the scheduling. Um, if when you schedule for others, I think that was Elizabeth's producer tip. Scheduling individual meetings for each class or setting. I would set up, uh, I, and I'm curious of Bonnie and Allison, if what y'all think about this. For me, I would set up one meeting that has no end time. Um, because then it's just one link everybody has to know. And you can drop it at the top of your Moodle course. You can send it to everybody through email at the beginning of the semester. And you don't have to keep up with where are you meeting. Because the recordings will be saved separately regardless. Bonnie? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the other thing is your polls will still be there. So if maybe you have a, a certain poll you want to do periodically, it'll still be in that meeting. So for all of those reasons you said, I would strongly recommend recurring meetings. And Allison, I know you said you do recurrent. So is there a reason that you do that? I do recurring meetings um, so that the time shows on, you know, on Zoom. Um, it helps me because I have several different classes going, but also the polls do show up uh, for recurring meetings as well. So you can keep up to five polls. Um, you do have to replace them if you have more than five, but um, I always use recurring meetings and I always make students sign in. And it's just, I think it just gets them in a habit of always doing the same thing instead of having to find a new meeting each time. So good reasons for, for both. Excellent question. All right, everybody ready to move on? Give me a green check if you're ready to move on in the next slide. Oh, All right, looks like. That, uh... Maybe one quick question for the recurring meetings. Sure. Uh, so how do you deal with uh, if on a given week, there's no class on Monday? 
so let's say you teach Monday, Wednesday, and there's a holiday on Monday. So, because you said, you don't want the students to think that they have to show up on that Monday when there's no class because of a holiday. Allison, what do you do? Um, well, I guess if, if there was confusion with the students, I mean, you can go in and just post a slide that says there's no class today. Okay. You could preemptively email them and remind them that there's no oh, class. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you could also just cancel individual meetings without canceling the whole the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Oh, look at that, I forgot I had them buried in there. Oh, I forgot one important thing is producer can do, I'll mention real quick before we move on. They can also do crowd control, right? So if you are teaching a larger course and one of your students does, you know, we've heard of Zoom bombing, does something untoward, they can be the one who takes over the security controls so that you can keep up with your contact. Um, and we're gonna talk about security controls a little bit later, but there is a button now under security that just locks everything down. So again, if you update Zoom, keep your Zoom updated, there is an option under security just to lock everything down. Students can do nothing. And so that can control that Zoom bombing instance. And then you can have um, your Zoom producer focus on like who to kick out or who to have a word with or whatever. Hey Beth, this is Scott. How do you know if you have the most recent Zoom? I checked while you were chatting, but it just told me what version it was. I still don't know if that's the latest one. So how do you know you have checked the latest? Sure. So I just stopped my share because I'm going to share my Zoom, hopefully. Um, so let me share my screen. All right. So y'all should all now see my Zoom within Zoom. Yes. Um, so it depends on your operating system, but I'm on a PC. So for me, you know, normally I could go down to my start menu and find Zoom. And then when I open the Zoom app, it's going to open this screen. Everybody see my little screen with my clock on it? Sorry, I'm moving it around. I can't see your faces while this is up. <laughs> um, and so I can come up to my picture. If you haven't uploaded a picture for yourself, it will be your initials. And I'll come down to check for updates. And then it'll let me know either you're up to date or it'll let you know that you have an update. Now, if you are currently in a Zoom session, like right now, it's not gonna let you update while you're in there, but it will update, after, you can choose to update when you close. Um, if there's a major release, you will see a line up here that says you have an update available, but normally it doesn't, doesn't push to you. You have to go hunt it down, which I think is kind of stupid, but that's how it is. Um, and just while I'm sharing Zoom, I'll show you my security button. There is this new option to suspend participant activity. So that's where it just locks everything down. They can't talk, they can't annotate, they can't type in the chat, nothing. All right, let me stop my share. Beth, while we're transitioning, um, oh wait, well, Bonnie responded, um, asked how to send a Zoom invite to the entire class? So there are a few ways to do this. Um, I recommend posting it in your Moodle course. I recommend posting it up at the top. If you are doing a, um, a, a just one meeting for the whole semester, you just say, this is our Zoom meeting. You can put what dates and times you need in there. You can also send an announcement. Um, if you turn on Google Groups for your course, you can send a Google Group email, uh, email as well. So I say do it two or three different ways so that students don't get confused about what you're doing. Um, and I miss, I see Allison just said she does something that Bonnie does. Let me see what you did. Um, Okay, so basically it's again, uh, Bonnie and Allison. I'm Bonnie, do you wanna walk through it? Sure, um, I just set it up as a recurring meeting on my calendar through Zoom. So that when I log into Zoom, I always see the recurring meeting there. And then I just share the link and post the link onto Moodle. So I'm not actually sending a calendar invite to all the students. It's up to them to manage their calendar. And I've otherwise communicated to them 
when the meetings are going to be on Zoom, which is normally the normal class time. Now I do, um, like they were saying, like Bonnie was saying, I, I, and as I just said a moment ago, do it multiple ways, send them an email, post it in the course, whatever, because not, especially with undergraduates, um, they don't know how to manage all these different technologies yet. You might think that they do, but they don't. Um, and, and transfer students who are still learning what the technologies are here, they, they might not realize I should check the Moodle course, or they might not realize, oh, this is going to my NC State email. So you want to get to them as, in as many ways as you can. Um, so I was just reading this um, small teaching online book by Flower Darby. And one of the things she says in the beginning, it's kind of like, imagine you show up to campus and there's no map and you just know what building. And so you wander around campus, you finally find your building. All the doors are locked except one. So it takes you forever to get in. Then you get in, you go into your classroom, the lights are off, the chairs are stacked. There's one other student sit, sitting there and you say hello and the student doesn't even respond. This is what it can be like going into an online classroom in Moodle the first day, right? If it's not set up well, if it's not inviting and encouraging and showing students what to do. So at the beginning, I would not worry. Some people worry about, oh, I'm spoon feeding them too much. At the beginning, just try to be inviting and encouraging. And then once they're settled in, you know, later in the semester, you can be like, you need to be able to handle this by now. But at the beginning, they're not going to know what to do. And so you want to make it as easy as possible. Beth, one thing I would add to kind of back to your um, original thought about practicing is not just practicing with one other faculty buddy, but I tried, I did practice sessions with my family or groups of friends, because then you get a group of people that have varying levels of sophistication and abilities. And there's also a lot of things you really can't practice with just one other person in the room. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a, a good way to practice as well. I love that. I think that's great. Just to piggyback on what Bonnie was saying, it's also nice when you deal with that type of heterogeneous group because they'll be joining from different types of machines. So sometimes when you deal with only coworkers, you have all PCs. So if you're dealing with somebody who's on a phone versus a Chromebook versus a PC versus a Mac versus a Mac that doesn't have the latest iOS, you can, you can have that dialogue. Can you see this? Can you annotate? You know, what are you seeing? Tell me so you don't have that with the students. Really good points. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to mention we were talking about interactions and we're about to get into it. The reactions button, Chromebooks do not have this. So it's just like those are some things to be aware of. Things work differently if they're on Chromebook, if they're on mobile, if they're on PC or Mac. I, I think mention limits. I think that um, the breakout rooms don't work on Chromebooks very well either, if at all. Uh, breakout rooms do work. I only know because I have two children on Chromebooks for okay. today. We have a, a couple of problems with it, I think, with Beverly's class. Yeah, sometimes things can, it's, it's definitely worth trying out with different people in different groups. And if you have someone who's on one of those one-off machines like a Chromebook, it's definitely worth trying in advance. Um, and having a backup plan. So for breakout rooms, for example, maybe if the students who can't go into a breakout room, the main room is their breakout room just for that activity. All right, so let's talk about adding interactions. Um, and it would probably help if I shared my presentation again. All right, can everybody see this woman staring in boredom at the screen? Like so many of our students sitting in our Zoom sessions. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Teaching a live online session, it's like teaching in person after lunch all the time, right? It doesn't matter if it's first in the morning. It's always like that. And I see some people nodding in agreement. Yes, it is. So one thing um, that's important to do is include some form of interaction every three to five minutes, three to five minutes. Now that may sound like, whoa, that's a lot, but it doesn't have to be a big thing, right? I said, give me a green check if you're ready to move on. I ask people to type questions in the chat. Those are small interactions, but that keep people engaged with their screen, with their keyboard. All right, so, uh, oh, I don't wanna do this yet. I want to stop my share. Dun, dun, dun. Cause I want to run a poll real quick. 
so I know how to tailor this conversation. So quick poll. How large is your class going to be in the spring? And you should be able to select more than one item if you're teaching more than one class. All right, so I have, um, let me see if I can share this with you. Okay, so we've got three people who have zero to 15 students, you lucky ducks. Um, one person teaching 16 to 30, eight people between 31 and 50, Ooh, four people, almost 100, and we do have one person who's got over 100 students. Oh my goodness. Um, Allison, you you're so lucky. You have three sections? Three hundred like charades. 300. 300. 300 yeah. students. Yeah. Got it. Um, so that's so much fun. Uh, so this is very helpful to me because it lets me tailor how I talk about interactions with you. Um, all right. So now I am going to screen share Zoom again. Um, let me do it this way, actually. If you know how to, if you do not know how to run a screen share, give me a red X. If you do feel comfortable screen sharing, you can give me a green check or you can do nothing. Okay, it looks like almost everybody does. So I'm gonna do very quick once over on screen sharing um, because there are a few cool options. So I'm gonna share my screen. And can everybody now see my Zoom on your screen? Okay, so whoa, I'm gonna click share screen again, even though I'm not gonna change my sharing settings. And just be aware, I cannot see your faces right now. Um, so type in the chat or just take the mic if you have questions. Um, but I wanna show you a few things with screen sharing. When you click to share the screen, it's gonna give you an option of however many monitors you have, I have two. You can also share just a plain whiteboard. Um, iPhone, iPad is for, you know, if you have one of those devices and you want to um, send it to Zoom, you can. So that's how some people do annotations. And then it's going to show you everything else you have open on your computer. Now, sometimes you have, I close a bunch down, so I would not um, slow down my computer while teaching today. But let's say you had way more things open on your computer. It might have a button here that says show more. Okay, so if you don't see what it is you want to share, make sure you click that button. If you're going to be playing a video or you're going to be playing audio music or anything like that, you do want to make sure, one, that you check share sound. And two, if you're going to share a video, you can check optimize for video clip. And this makes it so that um, you don't have, you know, that lag where people just see a tiny bit of movement because it can't keep up with the um, screen refresh. But if you're not sharing a video, don't check this. It, it makes it bad. So only when you're sharing video. Um, and then just so you know, on the advanced tab, there are a few things. One is this PowerPoint is virtual background. It will actually make your PowerPoint show show up behind you. So you can be very Vanna White with your show. Um, and you can choose to share just a portion of your screen. You can share just computer sounds. We do this a lot, like Jessica and I do this a lot to share music at the beginning of a workshop. And, and if you happen to have a doc cam or you've set up your phone to be a doc cam, you can share that through here as well. Beth, there was a question, um, which is a good one. If you have two monitors, can you put your presentation in one screen and your student gallery view from your Zoom call in your other screen? Yes. That's what I do. So I've got my presentation open on one screen and I share that and I've got y'all open on my other screen and I share that. Um, so a couple of tips with that and, and Bonnie, Allison, Jessica, any Elizabeth, anybody feel free to chime in on this. One is with PowerPoint, it generally works better to just open PowerPoint, open Zoom, share PowerPoint and then launch the slideshow. If you launch the slideshow before you share, sometimes you get weird things happen. The second thing is if you have, an, um, usually if you have more than one monitor, you also have an external webcam. 
put the webcam above where the students are so that you are talking to the camera, right? If I had my camera above where my PowerPoint is, I'd be like this the whole time looking off to the side and that's not pleasant. Um, so position your camera where you're gonna be focused most of the time. Um, anybody wanna add anything to that? I often instruct faculty to um, utilize the share portion of screen and then you can, it will, it's under the advanced tab and sharing, and then it will draw a, I believe the color is green, box that you can size and draw that around your PowerPoint slide. So therefore you don't have to be in presentation mode. You can, so you can keep your mouse functionality. If that is a way you would like to point out things on your screen, you, you don't lose, um, you still have your mouse, which some folks like. Hey Beth, it might be really useful to talk about how to view gallery versus just the speaker because some people might not know how to get everyone up on the screen. Yeah, that's a great point. I have that later, but I'm just gonna do it now. Um, no, 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 totally fine because I tend to talk long in the beginning and so we're gonna be rushing at the end. <laughs> so if you are currently looking at your screen in the upper right corner of the video area, you should have a view button and it will let you switch back and forth between speaker view and gallery view, right? So you can change whether you're seeing just the active speaker or whether you're seeing the gallery. Um, there are some settings associated with this that you can change. Um, let me make sure I know what they are. Let me share this with you. Once again, gonna share my zoom with you. Okay, so if I go down to my video and I click to go to video settings, you'll notice that, um, well, one is you can make yourself look even nicer by touching up your appearance. You can also adjust for low lighting. Um, you can choose how many participants are displayed in gallery view. So you can see more if you have bigger classes. Um, and you can see yourself as the active speaker <laughs> when you're talking. So if you've got it set to active speaker, uh, normally it does not do that for you. You can also choose to hide non-video participants. So like everybody who's attending today and is not sharing their video, I could just hide those black boxes. Um, don't recommend doing this if you call on students a lot in class, or, you know, if you call on them, regardless of whether they have video on or not, you'll forget to call on people who you don't see. Uh, but it can be really helpful if you're in a meeting or something, you just want to be able to focus on who's actually got their cameras on. Now, those view settings change when the screen is shared. So I encourage you when I go back to sharing the screen, play with them then as well. Okay. Um, and they also change when you're the host versus when you're a participant. So play with it the next time you're leading your own meeting. Um, I'm trying to remember, I feel like there was one more thing I was going to say about that. Nothing. Hey Beth, one thing I wanted to mention when you were talking about if you have videos embedded in your PowerPoints, they won't play from PowerPoints. You have to show them from your desktop. So I found that out earlier that you won't hit you to play, but you won't have any sound. So if you, I used to, I bet a lot of videos in my PowerPoints when I'm in a classroom, but when I go on Zoom, I have to actually show my desktop so that sound comes out versus video. I found that out the hard way. I thought I'd broken it. That's good to know, thank you so much. All right, any other questions before we move on? You can type in the chat or you can take the mic. Um, Allison, I'm gonna throw this back to you. What's the difference between joining straight from Moodle? So for example, when for this meeting, I just clicked on the link and I didn't sign on through Moodle and uh, it won't let me change my gallery view to 49 people. It won't let me do a lot of different things. It won't let me add a virtual background. Um, but when I sign on through Moodle, I have a lot more options. And I guess it's just because of the way that I don't, I don't really know why, but the point I is- I know why. <laughs> All right, and it's not technically signing on through Moodle. It's because of clicking the link through Moodle doesn't sign you on. And this is really, really important to tell your students, 
Okay. And we're going to talk in just a bit about, um, actually, I'll just jump ahead and, and um, show you it now. You want to force your students to log in if you want to take attendance. If you want to pre-assign breakout rooms, you want to force them to sign in like Allison was talking about. So here's the thing. Zoom gives everybody a free account, right? The free account gives you 40 minutes in a meeting if you were running it, and it gives you very limited functionality. At NC State, your Unity ID is tied to a Zoom Pro account. The Pro account is what gives you all of these extra features. There are two ways to sign in to your Zoom account. One, let me share my screen. Uh, I got to bring it up first. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. So the first way that you can sign in, the easiest way to tell students to do it is that ncsu.zoom.us. You go here. It's not going to load very quickly now for me. Can everybody see the, the NC? Okay, it's not giving me the green outline right now for some reason. Um, you click Shibboleth login. I'm already logged in today, so it should go right in. Oh no, now I'm going to have to authenticate. Okay. <laughs> And now that I'm logged in here, if I join the meeting, I'm already logged in. The other way to do it is again, if you have, um, stop my share and start it again. All right, so you see my Zoom. Again, if I launch Zoom from my menu, I'm on a PC, it may look different if you're on a different thing. You come to Zoom. If you're not logged in, there's going to be a big thing here that says you're not logged in. I don't know if it's going to let me sign out while I'm in a session. Here we go. So you come to the sign in screen and you click sign in with SSO. Then you put ncsu.zoom.us. And when you do that, it's going to take you to that same website, ncsu.whatever, and it'll log you in. Um, so the reason that is important is uh, because you get to log in with all your features, it will track who you are, it's tied to the Unity ID. Okay, so that's important for attendance taking. The other thing that you can do though, to force people to sign in, and I tried to do it today, but see, I didn't set up my meeting correctly, this is why you gotta practice ahead of time with other people, um, is I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen one more time. All right, and go back to NCSU Zoom. Oh, here we go. So if I go to my settings, you can set up a waiting room. So if you set up your waiting room for users not in your account to go into the waiting room, you can then click this customize waiting room and change your message to say, you can see mine says, uh-oh, if you're here, it means you did not log in with your NC State Unity ID. Please visit ncsu.zoom.us and log in. And so you can send any student who didn't log in correctly to the waiting room and they'll get this message. And then you could choose to let them in if you want, or you can wait till they actually pay attention and fix the problem and then come back. And so this forces students to log in before they come to your session. Beth, can I ask a question? Yeah. So I also assume that if you have the Zoom button set up in Wolfware for your course, um, that so when they go to Wolfware and instead of clicking on Moodle, um, I always just go to my course and then I click on the Zoom button, which signs me in that way too through through Moodle. Can students do that also? You yes, have it set up, but students don't do that. <laughs> In general, students don't go to Wolfware very often. They they have a bad tendency of bookmarking your Moodle site and never visiting Wolfware again. Yeah. All right, great questions. Um, 
was I going to talk about next? Oh, so with screen sharing, um, one thing that you'll notice we've done today and that you can do in your own courses is to encourage students to annotate on the screen. So we talked about you can have, um, now I've messed up my view settings and everybody's in a little line instead of my big view because I was showing everybody how to do stuff. I messed everything up. Okay, so um, there's two ways that you can do annotations with your students. One is you can just do a plain whiteboard, right? Share screen, whiteboard, plain screen. You can ask them to use the annotation tool to type on it. Again, I'm going to share these slides with you. So if you want the lovely little graphic that even shows how to get to the annotation tools, you can um, drop it into your own slideshow. And which is the other way that I like to do annotations. Um, I set up my PowerPoint slides to have space for annotations. So they'll either just have like the question written at the top and a big blank screen, or I might, if it's a small class, 15 or less, I might set it up like this with a grid so everybody knows to go pick a spot to start typing in. Okay. And that can be a way to have interaction with your students. And there was a question about, let me see what's next on my slides. Stop my screen share for a second. There was a question about how to run polls. So polls is the next thing that I was gonna talk about. Um, the way that we run polls and everybody who does this all the time, correct me if I'm wrong, because I tend to mess setting this up. I forget where things are just like you do. Um, share my screen. All right, can everybody see the Zoom website again? All right, so a lot of the things that you do are actually from the Zoom website. So to set up polls, once you've already created your meeting, it's being so slow because I'm in front of you. Once you've already set up your meeting, you would come find your meeting and just click on the header. And you scroll to the bottom and you can see there's a poll section. And then you just click add. Polls are, there's only one type of poll really. It's either multiple choice or select all that apply, but there's no just open-ended questions here. If you want more control over what kind of polling you do, I strongly recommend going to visit the Top Hat uh, folks. So there's a whole lot of Top Hat training available from Delta and it, it's much more robust polling. Um, but here I might add a poll to just called um, Port. I ignore my bad typing. You can make it anonymous. So this is an after your Zoom meeting ends, you can generate reports that show you what the poll answers were. You cannot see the poll answers during the session other than the general, the same stuff I showed you. Four people answered this, three people answered this. But after the session, you can generate a report at ncsu.zoom.us and see who answered what. But if you don't want to know, if you just want it to be anonymous, check the anonymous box, right? So then you'd put in your question. Whether you want it to be multiple, uh, pick one choice or pick multiple choices, and then you could type in the answers, love, right, and save it. And then when you're in your Zoom session, you go to your control panel and as host or co-host, you can click polls and select which poll you want to run. Now you can create polls on the fly while you're in your session, but I don't recommend it. It's very difficult to try to do while you're actually running. All right, so again, I just clicked polls chose to launch the poll, here we are. Questions about running the polls. Again, you can ask your Zoom producer, if you're not comfortable using the technology, you can ask the Zoom producer to um, run the polls for you. You can ask them to create the polls, you can ask them to run the polls. You just would go, Jessica, can you launch the polls for me? And, and, and that way you can focus on your content. Um, so let me share my screen. Beth, can I add a couple of points about polls? Yes. Um, 
So some things I found out kind of the hard way when I first started using them. Um, one is that if you add a question to a poll, that means all the questions in the poll are gonna show up at the same time. So if you wanna space out questions, you need to put them in separate polls. Um, the other thing to remember when, when you launch a poll, you're gonna be seeing the results, but the students aren't. So you have to share the results and stop sharing. Um, I think a lot of times you see the results in front of you and forget that nobody else can see them besides you. So you gotta make it a point um, to share the results. The other thing is if you have a poll that you wanna use in a bunch of different classes, you need to put it in a template first. You need to create it as a template and then you can add it to different classes. But once you put it in one class, as far as I know, you're gonna to have to recreate it in another class if you wanna use it again. Um, so if you have something that's going to take a little bit of time to put together a poll and you think you're going to reuse it, put it together as a template first. It helps to turn your microphone on. Bonnie, would it be the same save as meeting template button that you're talking about? Yeah, and that might be new because that looks like that that's um, it, that polls already within a meeting. So I guess when I first did polling, you could you had to start with it being a template. You couldn't save it as a template after you've created it. So that must be an improvement they put in. Well, and I'm this is the meeting we're currently in, so it's probably all kinds of crazy. Yeah. Polling is definitely one of those things when we talked about practicing, you want to practice it with another group first, because even today running my poll, like I thought I had set up two polls, but apparently I didn't save the second one. So I only got one poll. Yeah. And the poll will only be in the meeting you set it up in, right? And so I got caught one time, I set it up in the wrong meeting and didn't have my poll when I was hoping I had a poll. <laughs> yeah, very good. All right, breakout rooms. <laughs> Everybody's favorite. Breakout rooms are can be challenging. Um, so we're going to talk about, let me stop my share real quick because I'll probably need to start it again in a second. Um, there's two parts of running your breakout rooms. One is the actual technical Zoom aspect of, you know, how do you set it up? How do you preload students? How do you launch it once you're in Zoom. The second part is how you how do you actually run this? How do you make it go smoothly? Um, so I'm going to show you kind of quickly how to set up breakout rooms. And then again, we have instructions on how to do this app um, that you can go back to. Um, the one thing I want to reiterate is what I said earlier, which is if you update Zoom, it used to be you had to be the host to launch your breakout rooms. That's not the case anymore. As long as you make your um, Zoom producer a co-host or an alternate host, which let me go back to my meetings and show you what I'm talking about. All right, so if you make a, a meeting, by the way, notice Elizabeth and I have given each other scheduling permissions you can give scheduling permissions to someone. Um, Elizabeth, do you remember? I never remember where it is. Where do we go to set up scheduling permissions? Uh, under settings, I think at the very bottom. Thank you. I'm gonna look for scheduling. All right, yes. So if you go to your Zoom settings at the very bottom, there's a scheduling privilege. You can assign scheduling privileges to anyone else on the same account as you, uh, same system as you, which means someone else at NC State. So you would just click the plus button and type in their email address, right? So if you have a Zoom producer, you can give them scheduling permissions. So what happens then as a, um, sorry, what happens then is when they come into meetings, you can choose, am I scheduling a meeting on my own Zoom account or am I scheduling a meeting on my faculty member's account? So I'm gonna click schedule a meeting, all right? Um, 
This is where Bonnie was saying you can save a meeting as a template and then reuse it again if you want to keep those poll questions. And we can turn on waiting rooms. Um, but down at the meeting options, if I want to do pre-assigned breakout rooms, meaning I know which groups I want my students to go into, I have to check this breakout room pre-assigned. And then if I've got a whole lot of students, I'm going to want to import from a CSV file. So here's the thing, they have to be in the right template. So you can download a template right from here, and it will tell you what fields need to be completed in that CSV file. Um, so you would take your student roster, you would load it into that CSV file and say which breakout room they each go in. And then when you upload it here, it will automatically create those rooms for you. If you have a smaller group and you want to manually create it, you can literally come in here and call breakout room one. And then I could add, you know, Jessica and whoever else to the rooms manually. If your Zoom producer is scheduling meetings for you, they can upload your groups for you. They can do all this creation process. So you don't, all you have to do is tell them who goes in which room and they do the setup for you. Once you do that, let's say we want to launch breakout and make sure you save. <laughs> but once you do that, if you want to save breakout rooms, sorry, launch breakout rooms, when you come in, when you come into your session, you would come and click breakout rooms, which usually shows as, as a button, but I've got my screen compressed right now. And if I had it already set up to go to rooms, then I would have an option here that's like launch the rooms that are already there. I didn't pre-set up the rooms. If you do that and it doesn't work right, that's okay. You have a Zoom producer. <laughs> so what you want to have happen in this situation, what I usually do is, is you can come into this, not you, your Zoom producer can come into the breakout room screen at any point and get it ready to go. And they just don't click the button that says, send to rooms until you tell them you're ready. So they've got, they've opened this up 10 minutes before you're ready for your breakout room. And if they see the students are not assigned properly to the rooms, they've got that spreadsheet. They can do it right then while you're still talking, right? And then you say, send them to rooms and they'll have done it all behind the scenes. No big whoop. If you don't have a Zoom producer and you're doing it yourself and you preloaded your students and they're not in the rooms, um, there are a couple of buttons that will show up. One is that it will um, recreate the rooms and reassign. You can try clicking that and see if that helps. If it doesn't, you have this choice to let participants choose the room. So what happens here is you would just create breakout rooms. Click when you click create and then choose to open all rooms. It's going to send a message to the students saying you can now assign yourself to rooms. They click the breakout room button, pick the room they want to go to and click assign. So you can then say, you know, group one, I want you to go in room one. Group two, I want you to go in group and, and they're responsible for moving themselves. Does that all make sense? I'm kind of doing this really fast. Um, Beth, did you leave out the just the simplest way to do it? If you don't care who's in groups, if they don't have to be recurring groups, all you got to do is <laughs> the button and just send everybody to random um, rooms, which is very useful at times. Sometimes it just doesn't matter who's in there as long as they just go talk. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I've been dealing a lot with faculty who are like, I want specific groups to go to specific rooms. And that's where it gets more complicated. But if you're just like break them into rooms, they're going to talk about a concept. Then yes, you go to breakout rooms. Um, and you would choose to create rooms automatically and it will automatically assign people to it. And then when you click open the rooms, all the students will go into the different rooms. Um, again, one thing to remember is depending on the platform they're in, they may have difficulty going into breakout rooms. Uh, so just be aware of that. You can also manually move people in. Um, there are some options that you should check out when you're not busy with students, like whether participants are allowed to um, return to the main session or not, and whether uh, you want to automatically move them into the rooms or whether you'll notice a screen pops up normally that says 
you're being asked to move to whatever room and they have to click a join button. So if your student is completely checked out, they never click the button. Um, so you can automatically say, no, just put them in there. I don't care whether they're paying attention. Uh, you can choose whether the room's automatically closed and you can also choose how long they have to finish their conversation after you close the room. So the default is I think 60 seconds, right? You come in here, if you opened the rooms, you come back to the breakout room button and click close rooms. And they'll get a message that says you're coming back to the main room in 60 seconds. So they can wrap things up real quick. Um, so one thing I wanted to show you with breakout rooms, and then I'm gonna make sure I check for questions. But I was talking about how you also have to give them, um, it's also about how you manage the room. It's not just about the technical, how do you make it work? So can everybody see this breakout room slide now? What happens in the main room doesn't go to the breakout room, right? So it's like, what happens in the breakout room stays in the breakout room. Um, so give them very clear instructions before you send them to the room. Right. So, for example, if I was going to run them today, we're not going to have time because we're going to run out of time. Um, but I would say, first thing, figure out how are you going to be talking to each other? Are you using the microphone? Are you using the chat? Just decide that. Um, make sure you give them the instructions about what are they actually talking about. <laughs> then I would pick, there's two ways of doing this, or there's more than two, but one is either pick one person to be the note taker. And they're going to share the, those notes with the with the group, or alternatively, I and I love this is you can have it where you share a Google Doc or a Google slide or a Jamboard, and your students take notes in there as they're talking. That way, they all have the notes. You have the notes, so you can see which groups are actually talking or not because you'll see the notes being built, and they have a reference point when they come back to the main room because the chat that happens in the breakout room doesn't come back to the main room with them. And ask them to pick one person who is going to talk when they come back to the main room. I don't recommend leaving this up to when they come back because you waste so many minutes uh, being like, okay, group one, who's gonna talk? And then they're all like, mm -hmm. um, so make them choose that while they're in the breakout room and tell them how long they have. They will have, once you're in a breakout room, they'll have a little request help button and if they click that, you'll get a message that group one wants you to visit their room. So then you can move yourself into the room. Um, let me make sure, was that? Oh, the last thing I wanna say about breakout rooms before I throw it open to everybody else to, to comment on is um, expect it to take longer than it would if you were in a classroom. Generally, it will take, like if, if you were gonna give 10 minutes in the classroom, give at least 15, because it takes longer for them to figure out are we talking with the microphone? Who's talking? Who's taking notes? How are we doing this? What are we talking about? Um, so a little bit more time for breakout rooms than you would think. Allison, Bonnie, anyone else want to talk about your experience with breakout rooms in this? I want to jump in real quick. Go, Jordan. <laughs> Hi. Um, I learned the hard way that... Um, if you are going to have the set breakout rooms that students do need to be logged into their NCSU account. Um, so if you are like having them set and you do have um, the same students in the group every single week and you're thinking, oh, this is gonna be easy. I've set out, the, the, I've, I've done all the work ahead of time. Um, the students still have to be logged into their NCSU account. So if they're not, <clears throat> it's that disaster mode um, that can come. Um, and I can definitely add on that it does take a little bit longer for students. And even if the activity that you ask them to do doesn't take that much time, if it's students that are in the same group every week, um, they still want to have time to do like the casual talk um, if they you know, have, you know, develop some type of rapport. Or I didn't do the homework. Do you think she'll still let me turn it in? Like that, those type of things. Um, and so I've logged in and students will be talking and 10 minutes into the breakout room, not even talking at all about what was asked of them. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Um, I agree with all that. Allison, go ahead. I was just going to suggest um, you talked about having the Google Docs so that they could work in their group. But then what I do is, especially if there's something that I want, you know, that I want them to share as far as answers or whatever, I have a Google Doc open when they return. And um, so what you have to do, of course, is you have to go to have a Google Doc and share that with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have the link in the chat. And so they go to the Google Doc and they then have to type what they came up with in their group so that they know that they're responsible for something when they come back. Otherwise, I find, especially in my big class, that they will just um, sit and not do anything. 100%. 100% agree with that. Um, in the last instructional design email that we sent out, the, the pretty one, um, there was an infographic about things you can do to um, engage your students right from the start of the semester. And we do have ideas in there about, you know, like starting with icebreakers, using um, fun topics and breakout rooms are great for those little, like I'm just gonna randomly throw you in there and give you five minutes to talk about or 10 minutes to talk about whatever you wanna talk about. Um, but don't throw them in there without a specific starting point because um, it is certainly true, like Jordan was saying, that you may go in there and they haven't talked about what they're supposed to be talking about at all. <laughs> you're just like talking about school and homework assignments. But if you say, I'm throwing you in a breakout room so you can have 10 minutes of socialization time with no topic, if you, especially like Allison's class that's 300 people, right? Or a class that's between 50 and 99 people, they may not know each other. And so they're not gonna talk at all. But if you say, hey, I want you to go in there and really quickly talk about which do you like better, cats or dogs? And then you send them in the room, they have at least a starting point, right? It doesn't have to be awesome. It just has to be a little bitty icebreaker to get them going. And so check out that infographic if you haven't already. It's got lots of ideas on how to do little things um, to keep them engaged. All right, let me see if I can find my slide. Oh, way off track. Okay, so we are gonna do some annotation on the whiteboard. If you're not comfortable annotating on the whiteboard, you can type in the chat. But I want to go over what are interactions have you seen actually in use today in today's session? And again, you can type on the whiteboard. If you go to annotation, there's a, there's a text tool to type. You don't have to draw, you can type. Or you can type it in the chat if that is more comfortable to you. All right, so I've seen some good things come up on the whiteboard. We've used polls. We've, uh, I've asked you to type in the chat. Um, I've asked you to give me green checks. Uh, I asked you to use the reaction emojis. We've annotated on the whiteboard. I can't remember if I said that already. Um, asked you to give me thumbs up. We've also even done just head shaking in the video. <laughs> Ask people to speak audibly. You might not realize it's a form of interaction, but asking you to stop and read a slide instead of me reading it to you, that's a form of interaction because I made you engage with material. Uh, another thing that you can do if you want to is uh, what's called partial notes. So, right, you used to sometimes we would print out our PowerPoints in notes mode and they could take notes down the side that go with your slides. You can build, um, if you want just partial slides that either have the header of what you're talking about or a little bit into it, and then there's space for them to fill in what you're talking about and encourage them to print it and actually write by hand if they have the technology to do that. Um, because you've probably seen there's research that shows writing by hand helps you process better than just typing. Awesome. So these are all good. So I want, I just wanted to point out, we used a lot of interactions. They weren't necessarily big interactions. And so you can build these in as well. The bigger your class, 
obviously the smaller the interactions tend to be. So you might rely more on breakout rooms for really big classes, auto automatic breakout rooms for um, classes and little checks in in the, um, sorry, the participant list checks kind of thing versus having people speak up audibly. Thank you, Jessica, for dropping the infographic link. All right, anybody want to say anything else about the interactions before we move on? Awesome. If you yeah. have a really large class, Scott has, and I've come into this, if, if you've got, I would say over 40, it, it can get jumbled. And sometimes the student is typing in a free area, but someone else posts before they, because right, you can't see when you're in draft mode. So sometimes it can get too jumbled. So um, use use with a, a size appropriate place because it can get hard to see. And you want to see all the comments if a student has posted. And that might be a case also where you work in a Google Doc, for example, rather than annotating a slide if you have a really large group. Really good point. Come on, PowerPoint. Let me stop my share and start it again because it's not playing nice with me. Okay, can y'all all see the teal PowerPoint slide now? All right, so we're, I also wanna to talk to you just briefly about engagement techniques that are not necessarily as interactive. Um, so, and, and this especially is, goes along with those larger classes where it's harder to put in interactions all the time. Um, I, before I go too deep into my tips, I do want to know Bonnie or Allison or anyone else if you have any tips for being engaging even when you're not doing interactions. Because I know you do them even if you don't realize you do them. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go into it. If you think of things along the way, just speak up. Um, so one is telling a story, right? Um, we all know this. Studies show that using stories keeps people engaged more than just lecturing facts. That's why TED Talks work really well. They're, they're very rarely just spewing facts at us. Um, this is, uh, sorry, for smaller classes, you can also ask students to share their related stories to the content. Um, this is especially important when you're teaching adults because uh, one of the key tenets of I mean, I'm gonna mispronounce it, andragogy, as opposed to pedagogy. Andragogy is teaching adults. Um, key tenants are that they want to tie it to their previous learning and they want to share their expertise, right? These make learning more relevant to them. So if you can encourage them to also share back with the class, they will feel more appreciated and like they're really learning with you. Vary your voice. Um, we all know this, but it's amazing how many instructors forget, especially online when you're talking to a group and everybody's got their cameras off and you feel like you're talking just to a wall, right? Um, so you want to make sure whoops, that you vary your intonation, use humor, smile. They can hear it even if you've chosen not to be on screen yourself. Um, try to keep your energy up. And if you normally use hand gestures, still do it because it will help you talk like you normally do. Uh, in fact, I'm even at a standing desk right now because when I'm sitting down, I'm more repressed than when I'm standing up. I, this is how I would normally teach is standing up. So I'm standing up with y'all right now. Um, anybody else have any comments or suggestions when it comes to varying your voice or being engaging with your voice? Um, one thing that I did, it took me about half of the semester, but... Uh, <laughs> but I was like, we have to get them more engaged was I started doing a question of the day. And as simple as that sounds, like the students looked forward to the question of the day. Um, and it was something as small as like cat versus dog. And one, and with a class of about 80 people, um, you know, the chat filled up very, very quickly. Some students like put their camera on to show their cat or their dog. And it was Aww. nice, like, you know, five minute break, um, or what's your favorite holiday or, 
um, you know, just something to get them talking not about like the topic, but um, they really seem to enjoy that. So yeah. that is awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, also planning along, along the line with being engaging, planning for technology gaps. So we talked about that you've got to run breakout rooms. If you, um, have a Zoom producer, this room works much better if you have somebody helping you. If you have a Zoom producer, again, they can be getting that breakout room set up while you're still talking to the students, presenting your content, whatever. Um, if you have some other activity that's gonna require time to set up, same thing, either have your Zoom producer do it or schedule a break. You're like, we're halfway through, let's take three minutes and, and you're setting it up while they're stretching or whatever. Um, and the last thing I want to make sure to say about this is enjoy yourself, because if you don't, no one else will. <laughs> if you're not enjoying it, they won't. Um, so yoga instructors will say when you're in a hard position that you have to find the joy, even if you're not feeling it. That's what you also have to do as the instructor. You have to pretend like you're joy pretend. You are joyful to be there leading this, right? You can't wait to be with your students. And so if you can act like you're excited to see them, then that will help get them more engaged. Um, along with Jordan, the line of what Jordan was saying of like doing a simple question, some teachers will play music at the beginning, right? Just to liven it up. Some will do like, I'm not saying you have to do this, but you know, a silly dance party or something right at the beginning just to get everybody excited or a stretch break together, things like that, that help you um, feel engaged with what you're doing. Beth, there was a question in the chat about when do you use these engagement questions? Do you, you recommend using them at the beginning, the middle? So I'm gonna throw that back at the instructors who are in here who've done this before I answer. Who wants to speak up? Well, it wasn't it wasn't my suggestion, but I certainly um, use questions not every day. But I think um, I got into the habit of talking with students at the beginning, just you know, noticing their backgrounds, talking about the weather here in Raleigh. Where are you? You know, just everyday kind of stuff. And so I think that that probably serves the same idea as the question of just getting students, you know, kind of situated. But I also like the idea of um, putting in some questions in the middle and the end. And I think it really just depends on where it's natural for you. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, my morning class, I remembered everything because it was my morning class. And so it was one of the first things we did at the start. Um, my afternoon class, when I was just hanging on with coffee and a prayer, um, they, I would normally send them to breakout rooms and forget that we had done the question of the day, but it actually worked out because I would ask it as they were coming back from breakout rooms. So it was more of a delayed effect and they would already started talking. So they were, I guess, more agreeable to answer, even though it was later in the day. That's great. Um, I would also briefly add that I think there's lots of good times to do the questions. I think doing something at the beginning to kind of get them engaged from, right from the start is good. I also think doing it at the middle of the end, if you give participation credit and you uh, maybe that day is not, maybe that day is more you delivering content than discussion, you can use those random questions to kind of see who's still paying attention. Um, because again, if you're running a poll, you can um, see a report at the end, or if you've got a Zoom producer who's there like ticking off, who's, who's participating, you can also save the chat to all of your sessions. I have mine actually um, in my Zoom settings, I have mine set to automatically save the chat for every single meeting. So I could download that and either look through it or give it to my TA and ask them to look through it. You'd see who's answering the questions and who's not doing anything at all. So you know, oh, the, these students checked out, these students are still with me. Um, and I even like not making it content related, making it something like, do you like cats or dogs or what, you, what would be your superhero power or whatever, because it's so random that it's, I, I feel like you kind of have a better idea of, are they paying attention? <laughs> 
also it you know might get some students back in who stopped um we only have a couple minutes left so i am done with my the content i'm going to go over again we could have done so much more but we only have an hour and a half so i do want to leave you with this and then we're going to, i'm going to stick around for a few more questions um which is just take a deep breath it's a lot teaching online synchronously is a lot so we're going to all make it through another semester like this and i know y'all are going to do great and the instructional design group is here for you if you need practice sessions if you want to go through in more detail any individual little things we're happy to help you um, if you're more comfortable doing it with a fellow faculty member or your family or whomever that's obviously an option as well um, and don't worry if things don't go perfectly it's going to be okay regardless all right i'm gonna stop my share what last questions or comments do you all have or things we didn't touch on that you want to know about can i just say one thing i got feedback from students last semester and they are so thankful when you teach synchronously i mean my students were like thank you so much for being there and talking and not just throwing videos up for me because they they are craving interaction so kudos to you i think or, or for all of us for sticking it out and figuring it out because i think it's important to them yeah i agree i've heard more thank yous this year than ever before and i think also just give yourself a break i mean the students know it's not perfect too and they struggle with some of the technologies but some of them know the technologies better than you and can help you so just you know let them give you a hand if you're struggling with trying to get something to work or whatnot you don't have to have all the answers and Beth, I found engagement worked better than I thought it was going to do. I, at the graduate level, I flipped my classrooms, but I had never flipped my undergraduate class. And so I used this as an opportunity to flip it. And so I recorded all the content ahead of time. I used a whole hour and 15 minutes. Jessica knows I wasn't sure where this was headed, but most of the times I went over an hour and 15 minutes. I, I went out of time talking about whatever I was going to talk about. And so I'm trying to figure what the heck did I do before? Uh, that took that much time. And so I, I found engagement actually better in this arrangement. I'm looking at all 25 of them in the face. I see all the names in front of me. I cold call them and they get very engaged. So. And kudos to Scott, his class, not only undergrad, it's like at 830 in the morning and he had like 90% participate you know attendance throughout the whole semester so it wasn't just first day of class they all showed up but and he pr highly promotes camera on at 8 30 and you're 20 years old so i mean it was rock star but i need to warn you i did have a couple living together and more than one morning they were in bed together so i just want to comment that sometimes things happen when you do that but it was fun anyway oh uh much information i got it um, I do want to point out again, we only have uh, like 30 seconds left. So I want to point out again, the um, infographic has lots, lots, lots more techniques that we didn't talk about today for engaging. Um, like Allison said, you can open your room early and be there to talk, chat with your students. You can stay a little bit past, like Bonnie said. Um, so check out that infographic. I want to thank you for spending your time today with us right? Um, you have now been a student in a class. If you weren't before, now you've been a student in a class, just like your students. So it's always important to feel what it's like for them. Um, so thank you so much for your time and energy. Thank you to Allison and Bonnie and Jessica and Elizabeth for being here um, and sharing your advice. And thank you to everybody else for contributing. And that's it for me, but I will stick around after the recording in case there's one or two more questions.